Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? When Sean read Sam Walker's book, The Captain Class, The Hidden Force That Creates the World's Greatest Teams, he knew that he had to feature him on What Got You There. Sam's book uncovered that the 17 most dominant teams in sports history all had one thing in common. Each had the same type of captain. Get ready to dive deep with Sam and learn the traits of these captains and how you can use them to improve your team or organization. Hey guys, Sean here. Before we dive into this next episode, I wanted to give you a heads up. I will be doing a solo podcast. Yes, a first for the What Got You There podcast. It's going to be just me behind the microphone answering your questions, talking about things you're interested in. So if you have any questions for me, email them over to info at whatgotyouthere.com or you can shoot me a DM or tag me on social media, Sean Delaney 23 or What Got You There podcast. Really looking forward to connecting with you guys, letting you guys hear a little bit more about me and my journey. So that's shoot those questions over to info at whatgotyouthere.com or via social. Thanks a lot, guys. Enjoyed this episode. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that your physical fitness is one of the most important aspects of your life. So why do you keep wearing those old workout shorts that are falling apart? Or even worse, when you're at the gym and something smells a little ripe? If that's the case, it's time to turn in those old shorts for a new pair of 10,000 shorts. 10,000 makes it super simple to purchase your new favorite workout apparel. My new favorite short is their distance short, which is super comfortable, lightweight, and perfect for all of my fitness goals. I can say without a doubt that 10,000 shorts are the most comfortable workout shorts I have ever worn. Like myself, 10,000 is obsessed with nailing the fit with the highest quality materials and construction. For the listeners of What Got You There, 10,000 is offering 20% off your first order of shorts. Yes, that's 20% off. 10,000 makes three types of shorts for every way you train. The interval short that's built for versatility and mobility and perfect if you're into a bit of everything. It comes with an optional built-in liner that's the perfect compression without being too tight. It's made from super fine Italian fabrics. Ooh, fancy. So it's not just functional, but more comfortable without losing any support. And you need that support. The foundation short that's built for durability and perfect for anything with barbells, strength training, or even a weekend adventure. The distance short, my personal favorite, it's a super lightweight short, breathable, and built for running. Also with a built-in liner, these shorts fade away while you run. When you check out, make sure you request their one-in, one-out kit. They do this super cool thing when you can send in your old gear you have for recycling and you'll get 10% off your next order. Head to www.10,000.cc forward slash WGYT to receive 20% off your order. And if for some reason you don't love them, they have your back with free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns. Sam Walker, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, excited. Uh, We were mentioning in the pre-call, I have a big sports background, so I'm fascinated by your work. The listeners heard your intro, but how do you articulate it is what you do? Well, I'm trying to do everything right now. I mean, you know, I've been a newspaper hack for years, you know, 20 years at the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, I was a writer and a columnist and an editor and a sports editor and a page one editor. So I've kind of run the gamut in that career. But, you know, in the background, I was always fascinated by sports and one particular thing in sports, which was great teams and what makes great teams great. So, you know, I started this research project in 2005, you know, and and it took me about 11 years to put it all together. So uh, I wrote this book and talked about, you know, my conclusions about what makes great teams tick. And, you know, that kind of opened up a new thing. So really, I've completely changed my whole um, my whole working life in the last year. I became a columnist at the journal. I read a column about leadership uh, and left my editing job to do that. And, you know, the book is funny. I mean, you never kind of know how a book will be received or what its value will be in the world. And what I found is that, um, you know, after promoting the book as a book, uh, it opened up all these other avenues. And so I've spent a lot of my time uh, doing speaking engagements, but, but also uh, consulting, you know, working with teams and companies on their leadership dynamics. Um, so that takes up a lot of my time. And, you know, I'm doing a lot more research uh, into 
this topic. I mean, I, the book was really about, you know, what is it that brings great teams together and allows them to have sustained success? But uh, the bigger question I always get asked whenever I, I talk to people about the book is, okay, well, how do we do this? How do we actually implement a leadership culture that's positive and that can can be excellent and sustain itself over the long term? So that's what I'm working on now. It's really just a practical guide to how uh, you can actually create this kind of team chemistry that I studied and um, you know how you can identify the right kinds of people to do the job. No, that's very interesting. And I'm actually really curious about how you navigate that. So I get a lot of listeners' questions about maybe a pivot point in their career. Maybe they're thinking of starting a new business here. You have all of this new stuff being thrown your way. What's your decision-making process like to figure out what route to take? It's chaos. I mean, it's <laughs> how, how do chaos. you control this chaos then? I haven't figured it out. I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's weird for me because, you know, I – I uh, worked in newspapers for so long, and newspapers are an incredibly structured place. I mean, you know, every day, you know, there is something that you have to do or you will be fired. I mean, you know, you have to uh, you have to get your story out and you have to hit your deadlines. And that was a very structured environment. And, you know, that was a, an environment that I really thrived in. I mean, I like deadlines. I like pressure. I, I kind of need a little bit of um, uh, the point of a bayonet sometimes to do my best work. Uh, but, you know, this year I kind of hung out a shingle on my own for the first time. And I'd always admired people who did that. I always thought they were brave and uh, was very intimidated by the idea. And now that I'm doing it, I realize how hard it is. And I'm, you know, 47 and I'm making a huge transition, not just in terms of work, but just in terms of lifestyle. I mean, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? It's no longer <laughs> like a five step uh, process. It's really you know, this weird thing where you have to search your soul and figure out, well, what do I want to do today versus what do I have to do? And uh, it's been really hard. It's been a stressful process for me. I mean, trying to, to figure it out and to balance life and work and uh, to take some time for myself and to, um, uh, to really stop this process a lot of us get into where work becomes sort of a cruel master and we build everything else around it. And uh, it's a work in progress. I mean, I'm really figuring it out. Every day I wake up and look at, here's five things I want to do and five things I really should do. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's always it's tough deciding juggling. which ones to go with. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm really interested about this then. So you have this career that's completely structured almost your entire life and then making this big transition. Do you structure anything currently? You know, I'm trying as much as I can. I mean, what I finally started doing was, was just sitting down and, and putting together a list of priorities. And, you know, I have a file on a computer and every morning it's at the top of my to-do list. And I, you know, I'll make adjustments here and here and again. But uh, I've tried doing that and that's helped a little bit. Um, but, you know, I'm still trying to get away from the great demon for me, which is, I'm the kind of person where if there's something that needs to happen right now, I'm going to do it, even if it's not valuable. So I've been fighting that. I, I structure my time pretty well. I've gotten good at, at getting organized. I'm on the road a lot and I have other commitments and um, I'm getting a better intuitive sense of how to do that. Um, the biggest problem for me is I need to hire somebody <laughs> to help. And, you know, in order to do that, I need time to sit down and conduct interviews, which I haven't managed to figure out. So, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. Yep. It's always a tricky process. So you mentioned your book, The Captain Class, a great read. I really did enjoy this. I'm curious, though. First off, where Where's the fascination that leads you to that book? And then you mentioned it started in 2005. What does that look like when you first begin with this idea? So I was naive. I mean, I really thought that this was going to be a column. You know, I was writing a column for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, for years, I had been fascinated by great teams. And my job at the journal was unusual in that I didn't have a beat. I didn't cover one team or one sport. I really covered championships. I covered big events. So the only thing I really saw with great regularity were great teams, you know, teams at the height of their powers. And, you know, I was always interested in what made them tick. What was it? Because there was nothing necessarily outwardly visible about them or it wasn't necessarily the talent or the coaching. It was, uh, it was seemed very idiosyncratic, their success. And I was always trying to figure it out. So in 2005, you know, I finally said, okay, I'm going to write a column about this, right? I'm going to round up. Here are the best teams of all time. Here are the 10 best teams of all time. And here's what they have in common. I thought 900 words. I gave myself a couple of weeks to do the research. 
And, you know, that was the beginning of it. And it was just the biggest rabbit hole I've ever been down. I mean, it was 11 years before I was, I'm still not done. I'm still down there digging around. So uh, it was immense. And, you know, what was immense about it was the most basic thing was what are the greatest teams of all time? I mean, no one had ever really done uh, an objective empirical study uh, with rigid criteria to figure that out. And, you know, every time I Googled it, you know, the lists were very subjective and were based on criteria that I thought was kind of silly. And uh, so that took years. I mean, I, I looked at 25,000 teams in the end from, you know, 37 different categories of sports all over the world since the 1880s. And, you know, just figuring out how you define a team in the first place is hard. And then figuring out how you define excellence is is another job entirely. So that consumed an incredible amount of time. And then once I had my list, you know, the real adventure began, which is analyzing those teams to try to see if there was one factor, one uh, common trait that they all shared. So during this process, when did you transition to this being a column to, you know what, this has to be a book? How far into your journey? Pretty quickly, yeah. you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. No, I, I first just realized that I didn't even, I tried to put together a list of, of the teams I thought were the greatest and I just kept uncovering new ones. And, you know, one funny thing about sports is it's so, we're so myopic. We're, we're so obsessed with our own countries and our own sports we love. And, you know, all over the world, I'd find these lists and they were very, uh, tilted toward the perspective of the fans in that place. And there's so many great teams all over the world. And I started to find these teams I had never heard of. And I was just fascinated. I mean, one of my early discoveries, I just call it a discovery. It was my own ignorance. I didn't know about them, but uh, the Hungarian uh, soccer team from the 1950s. And I knew nothing about this team. And I saw that they had, I think for four years and 52 matches, they only lost once. And this is a, a team from a tiny, poor, one of the poorest countries in Europe, a small country with, with no great soccer tradition. And, you know, they had dominated the world out of nowhere and then poof, it was gone, you know, and, and it was over. And I found another team, which I had no idea, the greatest Olympic team of all time, right? I mean, if you ask people that question, I think the last uh, place they would ever look is Cuba. But the Cuban women's volleyball team from 1990 to 2000, I came across this team and I could not believe it. I mean, they did not lose a match of any consequence for 10 years. And this is Cuba, right? I mean, this is a repressed, poor, tiny country of 9 million people, which had no great tradition of volleyball, but for some reason put together this incomparable team that just dominated the world, dominated for 10 years. And, you know, I started to see this and think, you know what, this, there's something here. This is fascinating. I mean, no one's ever looked at these teams. No one's ever tried to figure out if there is some uh, something that binds them. You know, what most people do when they do research, like they uh, looking for excellence as well, they'll look at all the, the teams that have a certain, meet a certain threshold of accomplishment, and then they throw out the outliers, right? They take the teams that are, or, or those subjects that are off the charts and just, just say, look, we're not going to look at those because the results we probably can't replicate there. We're not going to look at them. And I thought, wait a minute, what if we just took all the outliers, all these freak teams that whose performance was just completely off the charts? What if we looked at them as a group and tried to figure out if there was something that they had in common? I mean, wouldn't whatever that is, whatever that secret, whatever that DNA is, wouldn't that translate to all teams on some level, right? That was my original thinking. So that got me, that got me going. And then, you know, as it went along, I came across this conclusion, all the prejudices I had about great teams and about leadership in particular were just completely upended by this research. And, you know, I started to feel like, you know, I, I really had gotten lucky and, and I'd found something that I didn't know that I thought was important. And, you know, I think that pushed me through. I mean, I, in a way, the whole project changed. I felt like I was on this sort of self-indulgent quest to figure something out for myself. But then I realized... I kind of stumbled onto something that I thought had a much broader application and was more important. And that really drove me because I kind of felt like I was the caretaker of this idea. It wasn't my idea. It was something that, that I needed to, um, to work my hardest to try to express the best way I could so that it would stick and so that people would respond to it. So 
that drove me. And, you know, I guess I'm, I'm a little obsessive by nature, but, you know, combined with, with what I thought I was finding and where I was going, I think that uh, that's the reason that I was able to, to push this through, even while I had a full-time job and a family and all the other things that were soaking up my time. Yeah, no, I want to dive into some of these specific teams and some of these captains, but let's set a little context here, give the high level overview for the listeners. So you basically find the 17 most dominant teams in sports history, right? Right. And then you break down essentially seven traits of elite captains as well, correct? Yes. Yep. So there you go, guys. Like he takes over the last 100 years, essentially, some of the greatest teams to ever walk the earth and, and figures out exactly what made these teams tick. So I'm curious about that volleyball team in Cuba. So you're studying them. I mean, what just just jumps off to you, jumps off the page that you're like, wow, there is something truly special about this team. Was there anything right off the bat you noticed? What I noticed off the bat was why there's nothing on the surface that made this team seem unusual. I mean, they, they had no, – talent was not their thing. I mean, this is a tiny island, and, you know, there weren't that many volleyball players. And, you know, their lead striker and their captain was this woman, Maria Luis, who was five foot nine. You know, and the average striker in Olympic volleyball is 6'2 or 6'3. I mean, they were not a great collection of athletes, so it wasn't talent. And I thought, well, maybe it's coaching, right? But it wasn't coaching. I mean, their coach actually – uh, was removed from his job for a couple of years in the middle of the streak, and they kept winning without him. You know, it wasn't it wasn't the coach wasn't important. It just the coach wasn't the thing that made this team unique. And you know, their tactics were interesting, but they were kind of crude. I mean, all they did was hit. You know, they would go into practice. Most teams would do you know a series or rotation. They would bump sets blocking this team just all they did was just hit the ball as hard as they could over the net every for three hours until they were exhausted i mean they just hit and, and that was interesting but you know not tactically savvy so i didn't think it was tactics it certainly wasn't money or resources but like all of these teams the one thing that stood out to me and i didn't even consider it as a possibility early on because i didn't really think that it could be that important but Every time I looked at one of these teams, I noticed the same phenomenon, which is that the beginning of that winning streak and the end of that winning streak had one thing in common. It, it overlapped almost precisely with the arrival and departure of one player. And that player was always the leader of the team or the captain. In this case, it was Maria Luis, the, the great Cuban captain of this team who became uh, the leader right at the beginning of the streak. And then when she left, it all fell apart. And I saw that over and over again, you know, with Bill Russell and the Boston Celtics uh, was another example. Um, I, uh, you know, in some cases, these players, you know, two weeks after they left, the whole streak ended. I mean, it was uncanny how, how, uh, how common that was. And that kept jumping out at me. And so over time, I realized, look, I've got to look into this because this is just too obvious of a pattern. And when I started looking at it, I realized that uh, these captains were unusual. They were very similar. I mean, they weren't similar people. They had different personalities and they had different races, genders, ethnicities. They played different sports and lived at different times. But, uh, but the way they approached leadership was always the same, always. And you know, when it really came down to how they led, they were extremely similar. And that pattern was just absolutely not what I would have expected. I mean, it's so unbelievable that one person could have such an impact on these teams, especially over the extended period a lot of these teams succeeded through. That's what, I, that's what took me so, that was what was so hard for me to process. It's like, how could one person on a team, in a team setting, have that much influence? And what I realized over time was what I'd really discovered is not that great captains make teams great. I mean, that's not how it works. You need a lot of things to be great. You need talent. You need coaching. You need a little luck. You need tactics, whatever it is. But what I really found was that these teams are teams that sustain greatness. So I wasn't interested in teams that won one championship or two. The minimum for me was four years. And that you had to have been dominant, absolutely dominant for at least four years in order to qualify for that list. And, you know, so these teams, what was remarkable about them is their ability to sustain it. A lot of teams become great with a million different styles of leadership and different things, but it's about sustaining it because once you become great, you have everything you need, right? You have, you've got the personnel, you've got the tactics, you've got everything you need to continue to be great. 
what, what your job becomes is maintaining that culture and guarding it and making sure that it sustains itself. And that's really an entirely different job and it's very difficult. And what that's when these, this style of leadership comes in. You need someone like this in the center of an organization who uh, keeps it functioning, who preserves that culture through the way they lead and, and has these specific traits and abilities that help pull the team through difficult times. That's the only difference between a great team with incredible talent that could be a, a dynasty and one that becomes one. It's what happens in those tough moments where it all could fall apart. And over and over again, when I looked at those moments in these teams, that's when I saw these captains leading and doing these particular things that they do in order to pull the team through. So it's not, it's not, you know, a lot of people think, oh, come on, it takes a lot more than a captain. Of course it does. The best analogy I can, I can give is that if you want to sustain excellence, the captain is like the verb in a sentence. You know, the, the nouns, the adjectives, the punctuation, all these other things might be way more interesting and memorable and important to why that's a great sentence. But without the verb, even if it's the last thing you notice about the sentence, it's not a sentence. It's, it doesn't have any forward momentum. It's not a whole. It's just a collection of things. And that is the role that these captains played. It was holding all the pieces together behind the scenes. And that is just not, not at all the concept of leadership that I came in with. So how did they get into this position of leadership? Were they elected into it? Did it just come natural to them and they stepped up into that? Most of them were, were what I thought was interesting, were, were chosen by their managers or coaches. And uh, some of them were elected in rare cases, but, but most of them were not leaders right away. I mean, they, they had time to sort of study and figure it out and they had some good role models. But, um, but you know, really they they intuited this. You know, I, I think that they, I think the thing that we often forget, you know, is that EQ is sometimes more valuable than IQ and you need a certain amount of it on your team. But I think these leaders were very smart. They were emotionally intelligent. They were astute people who were able to kind of figure out the right kinds of behavior uh, to sustain greatness. And they had this incredible relentless drive to be great. And they had this high expectation that things were going to work out. And, you know, that energy that they put in, they, they did all kinds of emotional labor, quiet, selfless work, carrying water behind the scenes to help the team. And they really did whatever needed to be done, you know, and they weren't interested in accolades. They weren't interested in glamour. They were never very rarely were they the stars of the team. They were usually role players, defensive players, support players. Um, but they would do anything, whatever it took, whatever problem there was, they would dive in. And if nobody else would run into a burning building, they would. Uh, and over and over again, I saw that that was just something that it was a conclusion they all reached without you know, reading my book or doing any research. I mean, I think they were just remarkable people who were able to um, – to so committed to the goal of winning into the team's collective goals that they uh, kind of just fumbled their way into figuring out the right formula. I think one of the things that was most shocking for me is what you just mentioned. Most of the time they were role players. And I know this really came out in the book uh, studying Brazil soccer and their legendary player Pele. Can you just talk about your conversation with him and what you really took away from that? Yeah, you mentioned what kind of kept me going during this process. And there were just moments, you know, when I was just completely slack jawed. And, you know, one of them was when I interviewed Pele and I didn't know much going in. This was kind of early in the process and, and I wasn't uh, I hadn't really done a lot of homework on, on Brazil. And, you know, it's hard to find good information about that team. And, you know, I asked him, I said, so talk to me about the leadership of the team. And, and were you captain? You know, I thought he would was the captain of the team. And he just sort of looked at me funny and said, no, no, never, never, never was I the captain. And I, I said, well, why not? And he said, well, I didn't want to be the captain and it wouldn't have worked for me to be the captain. And it was just one of those moments where I was like, wait, what? You know? And what he said, I'll never forget it. I mean, he said, On, in Brazil, you know, teams are hard to unify. I mean, it's a very diverse country. I mean, there, there are people with lots of education and none, you know, and there are people of different, all kinds of different backgrounds. And it's a very difficult place to, to run a team. And what Pele said was, you know, I was 
Pele. You know, I had to work on being Pele and scoring and leading the team. And you know, he was the biggest celebrity in the world. I mean, the pressure on him alone to produce uh, in that country, which is crazy about soccer, uh, was immense. And the idea that he could also do the hard work behind the scenes of leading the team and seeing to all of its needs was just completely unrealistic. And, and it was something no one in Brazil even considered. I mean, they didn't even think that he, there was a possibility. He was never captain of any of the teams he was on, even the club teams. It was just not in their uh, formula. And I think because Brazil was a unique place, I think they stumbled into this incredible formula. And what I found was that the captain of this team, the great team that I looked at, the one that won two consecutive World Cups in 58 and 62, and then you know went on to win a third in 1970, the captain of that team originally was this guy, Hildoraldo Bellini, you know, who I'd never heard of, but uh, he was a central defender and he never scored a goal in his entire career in Brazil. I mean, he was just a tackling dummy for the other team's, you know, star forwards. And uh, he was incredibly tough and quiet and relentless and worked just exhaustively behind the scenes. But uh, Brazil understood this. I mean, they just they just figured it out. And I don't think it was a conscious decision, but they understood that the job of a leader is to mine to all the small tasks and little conflicts and problems inside the team constantly. And the job of a superstar is to be a superstar. And you can't combine those two functions. And that's one of the great problems we have with leadership generally and with captaincy, not just in sports, but in business. I mean, we keep taking the highest performer and the, and the most accomplished person and giving them leadership because we think that the person who makes the biggest contribution to the outcome is inherently the leader, and the most important person should sh is the person who's run the team. That's absolutely the wrong approach. Those people need to be given the space they need to do what they do, which is remarkable and unusual and incredible. Uh, leadership is hard work. It's not glamorous. It is not an honor. It is a incredibly uh, difficult thing, and they understood that immediately, and that. Meeting with Pele really opened my eyes to, to uh, how important that is, that separation of, of power. What about teams you came across who superstar was the captain? So rare and so amazing. And, you know, I go right to Tom Brady uh, because Tom Brady to me is, is the epitome of this. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's one of the greatest quarterback of all time, I mean, period. I, I don't know how you even mount an argument against that at this point, but – uh, he was a sixth round draft pick, you know, no one saw that talent in him. You know, the only reason he's even in the NFL is that Drew Bledsoe, you know, forgot to run out of bounds and, you know, got clobbered. That's the only reason, you know, and Bill Belichick, you know, was a guy with a losing career record. who had been fired from the Browns who'd given a very bizarre, weird press conference with the New York Jets. And everybody just thought this guy's not head coach material. Right. And now look at them, you know, they're the greatest sort of captain coach tandem I've ever seen. And, you know, Brady is the epitome. Now it's just, he's a unicorn. I mean, he is a unicorn and, you know, it's just so, it's so difficult for a star to do that and to take on both roles, but it's possible. He did it. You know, there were a few uh, people in my, I think three or four people, I think were legitimate superstars and also leaders. So it's possible. I just wouldn't recommend it. I just don't think most people have the ability to not only prepare to perform at the level that Brady does, but to also do all the hard work behind the scenes that nobody sees and that he never gets credit for uh, in holding that team together. When I first set out reading the book, I guess my initial thoughts might be the importance of the coach. And most of the time I would have thought it was the coach who was everlasting in these great teams. What's the relationship like with the coach and this captain? That is a great question. That was a stumper for me. I did not understand it. I think probably the biggest surprise, there were a lot of big surprises, but the, one of the biggest was uh, the coaches of these teams. I mean, it wasn't just that they weren't, really elite coaches. It was that when I looked at that list of 17 teams, there was only one coach who anyone would have considered a great coach before they started that winning streak. And all the rest of them were um, people who had, like Belichick, they had a losing record or they'd been fired from their last job or uh, they had very little coaching experience or none whatsoever when these streaks started. So it wasn't coaching, but I, I knew the coaches were important. And 
you know, it took me a long time to unravel this. And one of the key things was Alex Ferguson, the great coach of Manchester United. And uh, Ferguson said something which really surprised me. He said, you know, I, I do everything. I look after every detail of my team, everything, everything big and small. I am obsessive about everything that I do up to the point of kickoff. And then at kickoff, it's up to my captain, it's up to my uh, leader of the team to execute on the field. And if you remember Ferguson, if you watched any of, of Manchester United in that era, he would sit in the dugout with his arms folded across his chest, doing nothing. You know, and you look at the modern managers, you know, in Europe, and, and they're on the sidelines and they're gesturing and they're running around and they're, uh, you know, looking busy. And and Ferguson just laughed at that. He said. What are they doing? I mean, the players can't hear you. If they can, you're just distracting them. You know, I don't know what these guys are doing. So I realized that there was a separation there. And what I found over time was that all of the great coaches on that list uh, were great partners. I mean, that was that was the one thing they had in common. And if you look at Brady and Belichick and Popovich, uh, Greg Popovich and Tim Duncan with the San Antonio Spurs, and you look at... Um, Alex Ferguson and his great captain, Roy Keane, when those partnerships were working, when those teams were winning, it wasn't like a boss employee thing. It was a partnership. I mean, they would argue with each other like an old married couple. You know, they would fight, but they were able to compromise and they were able, sometimes the captain would get their way. Sometimes the, the, the coach or manager would get their way, but it was a different kind of relationship. It was, it was very intimate and intense but they knew how to argue, knew how to fight without hurting each other's feelings. And they were both capable of taking direction from the other. And that is something that I think applies so broadly, not just to sports, but also in business. Everyone needs a second. They need a captain, but they have to have a relationship, of, uh, in, give them independence and autonomy and have a partnership with that person. Uh, it's not hierarchical. It's You don't want a yes man in that role. You want someone who is going to work with you, who you trust, who you um, admire, and whose opinion you respect. And that's really the role of a great manager. I never realized it. I mean, I, it, that's what it is. It's finding those people who can, who you can work with to execute um, your vision, but also take direction from them. And it's not the way that we usually think about hiring uh, our direct reports. Yes, yeah, such incredible insights there. And I'm glad you were able to apply that for the listeners, maybe in different fields they're in, whether that be business or sports. I'm curious when talking about partnerships, was there any team where they had a great leader for say the first few years of their success and then that leader helped transition a new captain into that position and the team was able to sustain that success? Yes, it's rare, but it's I have seen this happen. Um, you know, I think that, the San Antonio Spurs are a pretty good example because, you know, David Robinson was, uh, I think, a terrific leader. They weren't, weren't as successful in his time as they were with Tim Duncan. But, you know, Duncan's first years was very close with Robinson. And I think he really modeled a lot of his leadership after David Robinson. So I, I think that you see that very often, that there was a, a pretty good leader when the great ones showed up. Um, but it's rare to see these teams continue. If you look at the Spurs now, I mean, it's, since Tonkin has gone, you know, they're kind of rudderless, you know, and, and they're just not looking like the team that they were in the past. And it's very hard to do. Uh, you know, I think they um, thought Kawhi Leonard might be that that player, but um, he didn't really seem to have the motivation to do the job. There was one team that didn't make my final list, but was in my uh, second tier of teams, 123 teams that were very close to being elite. And it was this uh, rugby team in Australia called the St. George Dragons, which no one's ever heard of. But if you're in Australia, everyone knows this team because they won 11 straight championships, which is just kind of crazy. I mean, it's really the longest streak I've ever seen of any one team. They didn't make my elite tier for a number of reasons, but uh, but that team is the only one I've seen that had a pure transition. They had one captain who was kind of the epitome of the type that I'm talking about. And he gave way to another guy named Norm Provan. And Norm Provan, you know, was different person and different personality, but had the same leadership style. And, and that was in the middle of their streak and they just kept it going. So you can do it. It's just kind of like lightning striking twice. I mean, I think it's really hard. And unless you build a culture around that team and you figure out how to uh, promote that kind of leadership and sustain it. Um, 
and you come up with a systematic approach, I think it's difficult. So really, that's my focus now, you know, is really trying to figure out how teams can build a culture and a framework and do a better job of identifying and cultivating leaders so that they can continue that success and that they can create, uh, you know, a virtuous circle where one good leader uh, influences the next and influences the next until you have, um, you know, a really strong winning presence over a long period of time. Yeah, we've heard a lot of the CEOs bring up culture here on this podcast. I'm curious, though, right now, another C word, communication. How important is communication for a successful team? What did you see out of the teams that you researched? How did they implement communication and how important was it to their success? Communication blew me away. I mean, this this is not, I did not find the answers I would have expected with communication. It is both more important than I realized, but also in some ways less important. And one of the big surprises of all was that these captains, these elite captains, all 17 of them, never fair, hated giving speeches. I mean, hate, you know, you think of the Hollywood version of sports or any or war or anything where people are facing a tough challenge. The leader always gives a passionate speech to fire everyone up, right? Well, they didn't do that. I mean, some of them did it kind of grudgingly and half-heartedly. Some of them never did it. Carlos Puyol, who was the great captain of this Barcelona team uh, in the 2000s, that was the most dominant club soccer team in history, never once addressed the entire group. He said he never talked to the team as a whole ever. And his entire career just didn't do it, didn't want to do it, didn't like it, what didn't think he'd be any good at it. And so they weren't these articulate silver tongued people that we expect. And that was amazing to me. And what I discovered over time though was that they had a very similar communication pattern. And it wasn't about speeches. It was very focused on one-on-one communication. If you watch them when they were with their team, their their eyes are always moving. They're always looking for that member of the team that needs to be woken up or needs encouragement or needs to be uh, congratulated or whatever they might need. They need some advice. They need uh, to talk something through. They're constantly engaging with people one-on-one. And they do this with this incredible level of intensity. They bring their, their facial expressions and their gestures and they use touch it's a very deep engagement, but they also listen as much as they talk. It's not a one-sided conversation. It is a give and take. And the thing about these leaders that made them so effective was that they could approach anybody. They were very good at understanding people and, and learning how to relate to them and how to talk to them. And everyone was comfortable talking to them, and they were comfortable approaching everybody else. And they would just run this endless circuit going from one person to the next, having these intense conversations. And that I've seen in business in my own experience. That is that is the key. It's walking about and talking to people and not just talking at them, but listening and, and, and putting a lot of energy and engagement in. So I finally came across a study that MIT had done, which just kind of confirmed all of this, which is they uh, looked at teams and, and effective teams, and they found that more than anything – more than how long the members had been together or uh, or their talent level, uh, they found that it was communication that set the great ones apart. And on all of those teams, they found uh, one person who had the same sort of data signature, and they called this person the charismatic connector. And it wasn't that they were charismatic, it was that they did exactly what these captains did, one-on-one intense conversations with a lot of listening and talking uh, with everybody. Uh, in a very democratic way. And, you know, it kind of confirmed to me what communication is really all about. You know, it's not about having a silver tongue and motivating people through words. It's about hard work. I mean, it is just a lot of work. It's just constantly being on the lookout and being ready to give to someone else and to have a difficult exchange with someone else. But uh, in the end, what this does for a team is that nothing festers. I mean, these captains would address everything the minute that it happened, and they would have the discussion, it would be discussed, people would feel like they had their say, and it would be tabled. And everyone felt accountable, but also that they were being heard. And, you know, that nothing festered. You know, nothing festered. That's what kills teams more than anything, is these personal feelings that fester over time and start to, to destroy motivation and destroy teamwork. And that's what that communication style prevents and has nothing to do with having a silver tongue. 
I mean, this is just all so interesting to me. In terms of business leaders, anyone that you've come across that you've seen maybe even these touch factors or these charismatic connectors, have you come across any of them? Yes. No. I mean, you know, when I tend to find them is uh, they're not necessarily the CEO. I mean, this being a CEO is a difficult thing. It's a very public job. Uh, most CEOs don't have a coach, right? I mean, they don't. So they kind of are a coach in some ways. Uh, not necessarily a captain. Now, one of the things I always tell CEOs is that, you know, you need a coach and, you know, maybe the chairman, you know, maybe the the former CEO, you need someone who is kind of minding you uh, as well. But um, I tend to find these people in the middle of an organization. I've had so many people come up to me. Uh, I just gave a speech in Detroit and, and one of the executives of an auto company uh, came over and said, I have someone just like this who works for me, who's amazing, and he's nearing retirement, and I don't want him to go, and, you know, I just, you, you, that's exactly who he is. Um, and and they're in these organizations, and I think smart managers realize that they are the glue, and, and they start to appreciate these people and make sure that they're well taken care of. Um, in terms of famous leaders, I, I, there's so many who have these characteristics, or most, or some, most of these characteristics, uh, you know, I think Steve Jobs had some of them, has some of the more severe ones. I think he, his relentlessness and his intensity, um, but also his ability to make conflict uh, about the work and not personal uh, is an underrated quality of his. Uh, I found CEOs who I think fit this model pretty well. One of them is Hubert Jolie, who uh, runs Best Buy. And the turnaround he pulled off there is really remarkable. And his whole philosophy of leadership, I think, parallels very much with what I'm talking about. Um, and Jim Hackett at Ford, I think, has a lot of these qualities as well. Um, certainly the humility and uh, the sort of natural tendency to avoid the spotlight and to work behind the scenes and to be uh, fiercely protective of his team and uh, uh, to be sort of very thoughtful and, and, and a more collaborative kind of leader. So they're out there. Um, you know, it's difficult without spending a lot of time with them and watching what they do to really be able to say uh, that they fit the mold. And that's one of the things that I think is really important about this research and, and important for people in business to remember, which is uh, it's not about personality. I mean, all of the qualities of great leadership that I found were really about behavior. There was nothing about God-given skill or talent. Uh, and it was nothing about what you say. You know, in order to really evaluate a leader and to understand what they do, you, c you can give them a million personality tests, but, but it doesn't always correlate because all that matters is what somebody does when they're in that team context. It's all about behavior. And it's very hard in a job interview to get any sense of what somebody is like in a team context and how they behave. And we need to break out of that bubble and we need to start uh, really doing our research into how people actually interact with, with groups and how they lead groups in a practical way. And that's what's missing. And that's why it's so hard to find these people because you, know, you can look at them from the outside and think they have all the right qualities. But when you put them in that team setting, guess what? You know, they don't do the right things and they don't have the right instincts. And that's the great conundrum. We just have to completely change the way that we evaluate leadership potential. I'm curious, someone like Kobe Bryant, I, I, I just want to know your initial thoughts when you hear that name in this context of, of leadership and captains. Not a good leader. So, so Not what about that? Because I'm looking at you, at your seven traits and extreme doggedness and focus and competition, where I feel like he checks some of these boxes. But what is it about him that doesn't make him a great leader? There is a, uh, a selflessness to these great leaders. There is uh, almost a disdain for the spotlight, there's, and there's a real strong reluctance to be singled out from the group. Um, they are not interested in individual accolades. They, 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 all of their ego, all of their focus is on the team and its collective goals. Really, genuinely. I mean, it's hard to find people who are really like that, who really care more about the team's accomplishments than their own role and their, uh, the perception of, of what they contributed. They're just not very common people. 
And all of these great leaders had that. They just cared so much about the team's goals that anything that put them in the spotlight was awkward or uncomfortable or difficult, or they did grudgingly. Um, you might think Tom Brady is kind of a celebrity. I mean, you know, he does a few commercials, you know, very few really when you look at it. Um, you know, and he's handsome and he has a celebrity supermodel wife. And, you know, you might think of him as one of these people, but really he's a very uh, quiet person. He's a little introverted who keeps to himself most of the time and is not uh, someone who who gets any great satisfaction out of his public role. Now, Kobe Bryant is the complete opposite. I mean, the best uh, example I can give is if you look at Kobe Bryant's career and, and, and put it next to Tim Duncan's, um, you know, you'll see that Tim Duncan made the playoffs 19 straight years with this incredible different variety of teammates in a mid-market team. And Kobe Bryant, you know, had a good number of titles as well, but, you know, kind of bounced around and had some really bad years. Um, Tim Duncan, I think, in terms of his record and his winning record, uh, is far superior. Now, both of them retired at about the same time. And, you know, that was that said it all to me is how they handled their retirement. So Kobe Bryant, you know, announced his retirement before the season. Every single town he went to, there was a whole thing, a spotlight. He came out on the court. They gave him a gift. You know, he got a standing ovation. You know, there was a whole video homage to him, right? Everywhere he went, he soaked that up, soaked that up all season. Tim Duncan didn't say anything about his plans. Uh, decided after the season was over, he was retiring, and he faxed out a 57-word statement, you know, <laughs> thanking the fans, and vanished into the mist and never said a word. And you know, they grudgingly finally dragged him out for a ceremony with his teammates, but, you know, this wasn't him talking. It was all of his teammates talking about him, and uh, it was just a completely different vibe. And I think that really shows you kind of the central character that you need to be a great leader. It's, um, it's, it's a rare quality, you know, and, and it's something that most superstars absolutely do not have. I'm thinking about all the coaches and business leaders who are listening to this podcast right now, and I'm sure they're picturing that certain person on their team uh, or in their org chart that, that might fit the mold for this. And I'm sure you're, you're definitely having some, some new meetings because of this uh, podcast. So I'm glad you're bringing this to light. What about the most impressive captain you studied? I know you brought up a lot of people. Is there one person that's just a little bit above the rest? Bill Russell. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, look, they were all amazing for different reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I have great affection for the ones I spent a lot of time with, uh, when I was writing the book, but there's no, there's no one who compares to Bill Russell. I mean, Bill Russell, so the background of Russell, he's, it's a shame because he played in an era of the NBA before people were paying as much attention as they do now. But, you know, he arrived with the Boston Celtics in 1957, and uh, that, the team had never won anything. I mean, they had no titles to their name. They won that first season his rookie year. Uh, they went on to win 11 titles in 13 seasons in the NBA. And the last one was the last season he played. Uh, right after he left, uh, they didn't even, I don't think they were even 500. They didn't make the playoffs. You know, it took them many more years to get back to greatness after he left. So he was the only constant on that team. You know, his coach, Red Auerbach retired and he became the coach too, you know, <laughs> and the owner died in the middle of their th a new ownership. You know, it didn't matter. He was the only thing that was constant about that team throughout. The thing that I think is so remarkable about Bill Russell is that he did this at a time when uh, no one understood what he was doing and no one understood him and no one, uh, you know, had any idea. This is America is a difficult place to be a great leader because you know, we invented Hollywood. We invented this concept of the Hall of Fame. You know, we we love to pull individuals out and hold them up as for their greatness. And we don't really understand, uh, you know, how important it is and what a collective mindset is. This is not really in our in our national DNA. And in the 1950s, in the middle of the civil rights movement, you know, on a team that was, um, you know, integrated and had, you know, issues at times uh, inside it. He was a phenomenal leader, but the thing that really impresses me about him was he was a big man, right? And in the 50s, a big man did one thing, which is score points, right? I mean, it was Will Chamberlain. It was, you know, you dumped the ball in the basket. You were the central part of the offense. He didn't do that. In fact, he was a bad shooter. I mean, he had, I think he averaged 15 points per game, which was pretty mediocre given the success they had. 
uh, he also wasn't a good ball handler. He wasn't like LeBron James. I mean, he he couldn't play point guard if his life depended on it. What he did on the basketball court were all the things that no one even bothered to count, like rebounds and blocking shots. I mean, they taught defenders at the time not to leave their feet because, you know, they thought it was a disadvantage. And he would soar through the air and block shots that no one thought were even blockable at the time. He played voracious defense, but he also, you know, was great at passing and great at finding his open teammates. And he would get rid of the ball as soon as he could. And none of these things made any sense to people. He was also personally unusual because he didn't like signing autographs. He didn't really care about the fans. He didn't play that game. He didn't care about endorsements or any of that. I mean, he was only committed to the team and people didn't understand him. They thought he was cranky. And I think the biggest mystery came after he retired. So after he retired, he gets a letter from the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame says, congratulations, Mr. Russell, we're inducting you in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And he sent out a note or a letter back and he said, thanks for the honor. You know, I'm, I'm, but I'm not interested and I won't be coming to the ceremony. And no one understood this. What is this guy's deal? Like, why is he so aloof and prickly? And why doesn't he want to be, you know, a celebrity? And why doesn't he enjoy the fans and all this? And, you know, finally, he, he said many years later, you know, why he didn't want to be in the Hall of Fame. And he said, look, I don't understand why the Hall of Fame even exists. Why would you separate one person from a collective effort, you know, and, and give them some honor without their teammates being present? And uh, that kind of epitome, I just sort of explain him perfectly. And and my favorite Russell quote of all was so succinct. It was about the mindset, uh, his mindset as a leader. And he said, my ego demands for myself the success of my team. And that's really the heart of the matter. I mean, he really cared only about the Celtics and how the Celtics did as a group and not about anything else. And uh, people didn't understand him. And he's still, you know, he's getting some credit now, but I don't think anyone really appreciates the size of his greatness. And, you know, everyone talks about, is Michael Jordan the GOAT? Is LeBron James the GOAT? No, Bill Russell's the GOAT. I mean, I don't know. The point of playing a team sport is for the team to win, right? I, I don't know what other measure there is. I mean, having talent and ability is great, but, you know, that that is that is the realm in which your success is measured in rings. And, you know, he has 11. So end of story. <laughs> this conversation has been absolutely fascinating. If you enjoy this, definitely pick up the book, The Captain Class. Sam, you mentioned 11 years on this project. What's your next decade long project <laughs> you're working on? <laughs> Probably recovering from that one. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, so it's funny when a, when you write a book, the funniest thing about it is that you don't really know what your book is about until people read it and then they tell you what it's about. And uh, I was incredibly surprised by the reaction to this book. I mean, I, it was a sports book, right? I mean, we, my publisher and I, you know, we thought, well, we're going to market it like a sports book. And, you know, that's kind of, we think, going to be the main audience. But what I realized right away was, yeah, you know, it was a sports book, but the real um, people who were most interested in it and were, uh, you know, coming to it in, in the greatest number were business readers and people who were interested in teams generally. And that, uh, that surprised me. And we kind of had to reposition the whole thing because, uh, you know, it was really being reviewed as a business book and talked about as a business book, um, you know, in sheep's clothing, really, uh, in sports clothing. But, um, so what I'm doing now is, is really trying to answer the question that, that I get most often, which is how do we do this? You know, okay, you've, you've laid out this idea of a, of a team culture that operates with a certain philosophy and a certain kind of leadership and, um, you know, how, how it can sustain greatness and, and how do we do it? So I've really shifted to the practical side of this, which is trying to figure out how uh, organizations of all kinds, companies, teams, sports teams, military units, whatever it is, um, can put together a framework and a plan. Uh, because I believe you can plan for this. I think leadership is something that we don't plan for. We plan for every other contingency and possibility, but we don't make a plan. And really, when you look inside a team, ultimately, you know, all that matters is that all the important leadership functions are getting done and that someone's doing them. It doesn't have to be the captain or the leader. It can be anyone as long as they're being taken care of. And, you know, there is a way, uh, and that's what I'm working on now, to try to identify the right people to do those functions and 
how to cultivate them, how to bring them along, how to, how to bring them to leadership in the right way without ruining them in the process. And then, you know, building a framework around them, whether it's um, uh, in sports, it might be practice time or team rituals, things that you do uh, around the team to make sure that that kind of leadership takes hold. So that's what I'm working on. I'm not sure what form it will ultimately take, whether it would be a course or another book or, uh, or something else entirely. But um, it's really uh, it's really about trying to, to actually put this to work and to, to build teams that are uh, built not just to win, but to sustain that winning. Well, I'm excited to see what comes of that. For the listeners who wanted to stay connected with you, where can we direct them? Um, there, I have a website which has um, some more information and my contacts on it. It's called bysamwalker.com. Uh, and I'm on Twitter at uh, Sam Walkers with an S. Uh, and I'm on LinkedIn as well, I think with the same handle. And um, uh, I welcome them to reach out. Great. Well, we'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Sam Walker, author of The Captain Class. I really enjoyed our conversation today. I learned a lot about great teams. So thank you so much for joining us on What Got You There. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that your physical fitness is one of the most important aspects of your life. So why do you keep wearing those old workout shorts that are falling apart? Or even worse, when you're at the gym and something smells a little ripe? If that's the case, it's time to turn in those old shorts for a new pair of 10,000 shorts. 10,000 makes it super simple to purchase your new favorite workout apparel. My new favorite short is their distance short, which is super comfortable, lightweight, and perfect for all my fitness goals. I can say without a doubt that 10,000 shorts are the most comfortable workout shorts I have ever worn. Like myself, 10,000 is obsessed with nailing the fit with the highest quality materials and construction. For the listeners of What Got You There, 10,000 is offering 20% off your first order of shorts. Yes, that's 20% off. When you check out, make sure you request their one-in-one-out kit. They do this super cool thing when you can send in your old gear you have for recycling and you'll get 10% off your next order. Head to www.10,000.cc forward slash WGYT to receive 20% off your order. And if for some reason you don't love them, they have your back with free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns. A few months ago, my body was experiencing a ton of pain, and that's when my friend and former podcast guest, Noah Olson, turned me on to Pure Spectrum CBD. Their CBD products have been tremendous in relieving a lot of the pain in my body. Their products are pure because everything they make is tested every time for quality, consistency, and efficiency. They're 100% organic, third-party tested. There's a 100% guarantee, and they're THC-free. If you want to receive 10% off the entire site, head to PureSpectrumCBD.com and enter code WGYT. That's 10% off the entire website at PureSpectrumCBD.com with code WGYT. For the What Got You There listeners who love to travel and want to see the world, listen up. We've teamed up with Globekick, who make it affordable to enjoy peak life experiences with like-minded people from around the world. Globekick expertly designs, curates, and scouts global adventures for you to join. Each trip lasts one week and is designed to balance their unique blend of adventure, culture immersion, and relaxation. Globekick has some epic adventures planned, such as cage diving with great white sharks in Cape Town, South Africa, dog sledding and northern light chasing in Norway, and to see the rest, head to globekick.com. If you want to travel the world with your kind of people and not break the bank, then make sure to stop at globekick.com and enter code WGYT to receive 10% off your membership. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? Thanks for listening to another episode of What Got You There. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and also share with your friends. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you next time. If you want to stay up to date on all things I'm working on behind the scenes and everything we've got going on at What Got You There, head over to whatgotyouthere.com. You'll also be able to see more on podcast guests and what they're doing. Thanks to Justin Great for providing us the intro and outro song. If you like his music and want to find out more about what he's working on, head over to justingreat.com.